I think the marathon holds an incredible, almost a mystique about it because it draws together so many variables and the athletes that run it, first of all, have to commit themselves totally to, to their training and preparation. They have to put in incredible mileage and incredible training just to prepare themselves. mentally preparing yourself for the period in the race where you are physically and mentally exhausted. You say, you know, will I, will I guts it out? Will I keep the pressure on? Or will I back off a little bit? And you always have to sort of mentally be aware that I'm going to get to a stage like that in a race. So that when you do get there, it's, it's, not, it's not a surprise or it's, it's something that you've been waiting for and expecting. A lot of people apply a sort of mystical quality to the marathon where even if you think you're ready for it that something may happen in that race and you may not run well anyways and I think there's always that chance but I think a lot of people run into trouble when they run the marathon because they're going into it scared already. set out at a pretty good pace. It wasn't too fast. It was a little bit faster than the, than the pace that we wanted to run. We wanted to try and run 310 per kilometer. And the first, the first kilometer was probably about 305. And every 5K after that, we were supposed to be trying to run about 1510. And we were running about 15 minutes for the first 20K or so. So we were a little bit faster. All of the traffic and the, the crowd control wasn't really very good. It was very difficult to continue and maintain your concentration when there's so much happening around you. But I think that's what you have to be able to do. You have to be very single-minded and almost block out every other thing from your mind and just concentrate on, on what you're doing. And as a result, you know, I can't really remember any stage being being flustered or being concerned about the, the traffic or the crowd. Although there were certainly stages in the race where, where they really interfered. Uh, once or twice we had to actually physically charge our way through the crowd to get back onto the course. You're out there and you're trying to beat each other, but at the same time you feel a, you know, an empathy with the other runners because you're all going through the same thing. And it is sort of a brotherhood, you know, and you, you pass the water bottle back and forth, and it's, it's a good feeling, you know, to know that even though you're trying to compete against somebody hard, at the same time you, you kind of want him to do good also. Sure, 
you probably have to push yourself or be prepared to push yourself through barriers of pain. The biggest pain that you have to try and work yourself through is just the incredible weariness and the incredible fatigue that sort of envelopes you like a, a cloud. You know, it's like one of those dreams where you're moving in slow motion and everything else is going, going past at normal speed and you just can't keep up and, you know, you feel like you're in molasses. About the halfway point, the guy who had been setting the pace dropped back, and I think he dropped out of the race. And I, I was still feeling good at that, at that stage in the race. And yet I knew that if somebody didn't start to press very soon, that we weren't going to have a chance of getting the record because we were already slower than record pace by about 20 seconds at that point. I think you really need to, to concentrate on uh, achieving little goals. You can't, you certainly, I don't feel, should become totally introverted and uh, draw within yourself during the race. Because I think you dwell on, on little things such as, you know, how your feet are, if you're losing a toenail or you've got a blister or you've got a stitch or, or you know, your muscles are sore or something. You've got to just, while you've got to monitor those things, you can't afford to um, let them become too dominant a feeling. Alberto seemed really very intense and um, he almost seemed you know, almost trance-like at some stages during the race. He, he was almost totally withdrawing within himself, uh, whereas I was just trying to just trying to relax mentally and physically. Robert started pressing the pace with about five miles to go or so, and with probably a little less than four miles to go, he really started to accelerate. And up to that point, it felt like it was starting to strain me a bit, but at the same time, I thought that I'd be able to stay up. There was only three or four miles to go and but then he really picked it up and he really sprinted up a hill and he just kept going after that and I went with him for about a half mile or so and I was waiting for him to slow down because but I knew at that point that if they didn't slow down there was no way I could keep up so I was just hoping they were going to slow down but unfortunately they didn't and they started to pull away and at that point a lot of things ran through my head because in the last two or three years, nobody's ever pulled away from me during the race. It's only been at the, at the very finish, you know, in the last quarter mile or so that I've ever, anyone's ever pulled away from me. And so I knew I was in trouble. It wasn't until several kilometers or two or three kilometers later that I realized that we'd broken away, Lopez and I, and we were the only two left. Everybody else had, had been uh, dropped off. There was no way that I could have kept up. There's absolutely no way. The last three miles, I just fell back. And, and even though I've run almost two minutes faster on that day, there was no way that I could have run any faster, you know, or that I could have stayed up with De Castell and Lopes. I knew that it was over, that there was no way I was going to catch him. For that whole last five kilometers, he was right on my shoulder or running right by my side. I was just trying everything to get rid of him and he was, he was just hanging there almost like a shadow. He wasn't prepared to take the lead. Even once or twice I eased the pace back to try and get him to, to do some leading and he just eased back to 
and I wasn't sure whether, whether he was tired, whether he was struggling a little bit and he, he was grateful that the pace had slowed, or whether he was just super confident that he'd be able to kick past me at the finish over the last 100 metres or so. One thousand metres to go, and he was still there. And I was picking the pace up more and more. Five hundred metres to go, and he was still there. And I was saying, "Crow, is, is he going to just sprint off and leave me like a, a rocket, or am I? Is it going to be neck and neck right down to the line, or what?" With about only a couple of hundred metres to go, I just sensed that he just lost that little bit of contact that he had with me. And I, as soon as I sensed that, I really picked up and I really put everything I had into it. Even as I crossed the finish line, I didn't know where he was. Two hours, eight minutes and 37 seconds. 24 seconds off the coveted world mark. What Dick Estella did not yet know was that after running the first 25 miles, 385 yards of the marathon, he covered the final mile in an incredible four minutes and 31 seconds. Well, he was still there. Yeah, we were both together with, with 500 metres to go, and then I really, I really uh, tried to, to just kick as flat out as I could. And I didn't know where he was. I thought he was right behind me all the way. Good mentally. He was getting a big old head. <laughs> hoping that the fatigue has built, had built up in his legs more than it had in mine, and I would have the strength to finish on faster than he did over the last several hundred meters. I think it's probably one of the best things for him because he has to lose some time and now it's out of the way and now he can just concentrate on doing the best he can. I know he's really hungry now for the Olympics. Just look after yourself. Yeah. Just, just settle down. Oh yeah. All right. Good for me. The year to go. Well, it takes a lot of pressure off him. Yeah. It must be really hard for him to stay. Yeah. Two men, one ambition. To be the best yeah. there is. Robert de Costello has beaten the seemingly invincible Alberto Salazar on the day. There is another day on the horizon, in Los Angeles, at the Olympics. 
a quest for gold. On your day. It's certainly very similar to an obsession. Uh, I think an obsession is something that you just keep on doing and doing and doing. And running is similar to that for me. It's just something that I want to just keep on doing and keep on achieving. And I really don't know when I'll stop. Probably when it stops being an obsession.